We are going to start with an interview. Um, I would like to invite Michelle Carey up. Um, and it has been so apparent to me that God is at work in this conference. You may sit, I will sit. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons I know that is that Michelle had said to me um, not long ago, I think God wants me to share my testimony. And when she did, I'm like, really? Like, I, I would never ask her to share her testimony. Um, but God put it on her heart. And about six years ago, Michelle um, contacted me. One of her friends had said, um, I think you should just contact Kathy. And so she contacted me. We got together. And the first thing I did was say, Michelle, tell me your story. And um, it's very powerful. And, and then the next thing we did was... We went through Lies Women Believe together, and we have been friends for <laughs> a long time now. Um, so anyway, I, um, I'm very thankful, Michelle, that, you are, that you're here and um, that the Lord put it on your heart to share. So um, would you give us just a little bit of background of, yeah. Sure. So I'm Michelle Carey, and um, I was born in New Hartford, New York, um, so upstate New York. Um, I was raised by a middle-class family. Um, we attended um, a church. Um, we were, we um, experienced most of what middle-class families would, um, piano lessons, flute lessons, figure skating, all of those wonderful things. Um, I was an only child until I was nine. And um, at 11 years old, I attended a school, a public school, and we had to go to a health class. And in that health class, I learned that things that were happening at home actually should not be happening at home. And um, in order to really protect my sister, my baby sister, whom I loved dearly, I needed to tell the authorities that things were happening that were not okay. And um, uh, because of that, um, my my father was arrested at work, and um, and my my mother refused to believe what had been happening, and so shortly thereafter, um, both of my parents signed over their rights to the state of New York, um, and um, I became a ward of the state of New York, and so my family uh, gave, gave up on me, and they, they let me go. Can I just say it takes a lot, a lot of courage for an 11-year-old to do the right thing, and it, it really does. So you went into the foster care system at that point, mm -hmm. and um, as an 11-year-old, you basically became an orphan. So tell a little bit about that season. Sure, it was it was one of the hardest, most painful seasons of my life. My um, my baby sister, who I was supposed to protect, um, she still stayed with my family, with my birth family, um, and I was the one who was ostracized. Um, none of my family, um, none of my aunts or uncles, or the I don't know what they knew or didn't know. So I'm not going to put them on the spot and say, oh, they totally abandoned me. But but no one stepped up to take care of me. And um, so I, I lived in the foster care system, um, but I was even a reject in the foster care system um, because I came from a middle class family. Um, I was told that I was just a spoiled, rotten child who's just trying to get her way and, um, and that I just needed to get over it. And, um, so I really struggled. I struggled with my identity, who I was. I felt, um, I felt like the throwaway kid. I was the throwaway. I was disposable. Um, I was rejected. I wasn't seen, um, and um, unlovable, unloved. Um, a lot of pain. A lot, a lot of pain. So what happened? And I remember asking you this. It's like, what was your life like when you aged out of the foster system? 
Yeah, so I, I was 18 and still a senior in high school. And um, the state of New York at that time would emancipate anyone who's 18, uh, regardless of if you finished high school or not. So I was emancipated at 18 and quickly found myself trying to find a place to live. Um, I had a job, I worked at Rite Aid, um, I was involved in a lot of things at school. I was very involved in music and um, other activities at school. And um, and I, God is just so good. I found so much favor in my life. Um, I ended up getting an apartment that was owned by someone um, named Judy. And Judy was, she was a godsend, she was awesome. Um, I ended up getting really sick um, and I couldn't work for like two weeks and there was no way I was gonna make my rent. And Judy, who owned the home, said, no, here, you, you can't live here. And I was, I was devastated, but she said, but here's the thing, you're gonna live with me, and you're not gonna pay rent to me. You're gonna live with me, you're gonna finish high school, and you're gonna go to college like you're supposed to do. And she took me in and cared for me. That's really the kindness of the Lord, yeah. So um, at what point then, somehow you ended up in California. Did you know? You know, people in New York think that California is where it's at, and people in California think New York's where it's at. So, <laughs> I'm here to tell you, neither one's where it's at. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so I, I moved to Los Angeles area, and. Um, I, I just thought, you know, I, I just get as far away from my past as possible. And, and that just seemed like a logical place to go. And um, uh, that's where I, I met my husband. And, um, and so when we got married, we decided, you know, living the rat race of Los Angeles uh, just wasn't gonna work for, our, for us, you know, um, working super hard, high rent, so um, his family owned a home in Boron. And, you know, yeah, Boron. And, uh, and so I'm like, yeah, let's get out of the rat race of the city, it's so quiet out there, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of how we moved out here. Okay. Well, I know that you felt like you were running from something, but God was actually bringing you to somewhere, and we're really glad that He brought you to us. So, um, so what did what did you find in Boron? What happened in Boron? Um, well, it's really quiet, so I read a lot. And um, I, one, one day, I just was happening across my husband's Bible that I just found, and um, I, I noticed these genealogies. So I was like, huh, this is interesting. I'm mathematical and scientific, and I like, I like to kind of delve into stuff like that. And so I was going through the genealogies, and um, I, one paper became three, became probably 20. You were charting it, right? I was charting it. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I just, something sparked an interest in me in the Bible. And so Johnny, my husband's name is John, Johnny, and Johnny's um, aunt uh, sent me a MacArthur study Bible. And I opened that thing and being the great book nerd that I am, opened to the front and read the introduction and saw, oh, this is how you study the Bible. And the plan of salvation was there. And my whole life, I'd heard people say saved, saved, saved. And I'm like, what is this saved? And um, I opened it and John MacArthur explained what this saved was. And I fell on my knees at that moment and gave my life to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well. God, at that point, God gave you a spiritual family, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, keep going. You went to church then? Yeah, after that, um, there's this little little church about a block from our house. It's called the Boron Bible Church. Yes, they have Bible churches in Boron. They're fantastic. And um, I, that's where um, I got hooked up with um, the pastor and his wife. And, and um, I started biblical counseling because I had a lot of baggage to deal with. And I knew that God wanted me to deal with that, to have a good relationship with the Lord. And so we quickly, um, we quickly, uh, became close. I mean, when you share intimate details of your life, 
that are full of pain and heartache, you just build those relationships very, very deep. And, um, and one day, so when you enter the foster care system at 11, 12, 13, you're not adoptable. It's not that you can't be adopted. Nobody wants to adopt you. You've got baggage, you know, especially some of the hurts that I had gone through. People think you're a pariah. You're the bad person. So I, I dealt with that my whole life. And Pastor Phil and Becky asked me on their wedding anniversary, can we adopt you? How old were you? Uh, I can't do the math. <laughs> <laughs> the math, the mathematical whiz can't do the math. Okay, twenty-two <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah, I think. But you, you had a daughter of your own already. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, um, when they asked me, I was, I think, I was pregnant with my daughter, and. Um, and so I, I was like, you can do that as an adult? Isn't that kind of weird? And, um, and they had never been able to have children of their own, ever. And, um, and I could never be adopted. And we figured out that there is paperwork you can do and you can become adopted as an adult. And um, my husband had to give permission. That's kind of cool. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he approved. And so we went to court um, on May 9th of 2003, which is 18 years ago now. So I guess I'm technically only 18. So that's good. <laughs> um, lived a lot of life for 18, but you know, that's okay. So, um, so we're sitting in the judge's chambers and the judge looks at us and says, you really want to do this? This is permanent. You can't undo this, not even in a court of law. And at that moment, I understood what adoption in Christ meant. I never thought that Christ really, really could truly love me and hold me and care for me. I didn't understand my identity until that moment when that judge said that and the, the power of adoption. Um, a verse had come to me this morning, Psalm 68, 6, and um, it says, God sets the lonely in families. And I, I thought it had said God sets the orphans in families, but I, I'm pretty sure that's what it means, you know. And I just think it's just the kindness of the Lord. I mean, just it gives me goosebumps to think that as as a 20-something-year-old woman with a daughter of her own, you you now have real parents who love you and chose you, and um, and that's exactly it, it's such a great illustration of our spiritual adoption you're right so um although you were saved what um what is what was that like just i know you you've been saved your um adoption is forever but as we were talking with the other women this morning um lies come in and i know you've had a lot of lies in your life um do you mind talking about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, I have had to deal with a lot of lies, a lot, um, that I'm unworthy, um, that, that it's, that I'm not okay, that something is inherently wrong with me, um, that, that my parents would reject me at such an old age. Um, I, I've had to deal with a lot of those lies, um, but... But what I have done, because I'm forgetful, I'm like the Israelites, totally forgetful. I, I've created a book, and, and, and in this book, and I carry this with me, this is usually in my purse, or it's sitting on my desk. And in this book, um, I have scripture verses um, that remind me of who I am and whose I am. And um, everything from being adopted, belonging to God, being called. I am a child of God. I'm chosen. I'm part of the family of God. I'm forgiven. I'm freed. I'm a friend of Jesus. I am God's daughter, his girl. I am honored and justified and known and loved and never alone. I'm protected and provided for. I have a purpose. I am redeemed. I am secure and I'm strengthened by God. And 
all of those lies are combated with with those those truths and um, the scripture that goes with it. I know the first thing we did was go through lies women believe, and I think that was probably kind of the beginning of. I, I remember after that you. We were talking on the phone, and you said that you were outside at your table, and you were you were writing, you were working on this book, and um, and then you made me one too. And you guys later on should come look at this book. It's it's pretty incredible. The thing I love about it, and the thing I love about you, is that you didn't just copy it from somewhere. These were these were truths that you needed and that God spoke to you. And um, talk about a practical thing that you can do. It's not post-it notes, but it's something that you can put in your purse and you can. Um, so um, I really appreciate your openness and your willingness to share all of that. Do you have any closing thought that you would want to share to the women? God is faithful and he is good. Um, you don't have to experience something as traumatic as maybe what I've experienced um, to absorb lies from the enemy. And God does not want us to be beholden to those lies. He wants us to feel the freedom that he's given us in him. And um, I would just encourage you to even find one scripture you can hold on to to remember who you are and whose you are because you are precious and you are loved and you are chosen and you're his, you're God's girl. And there's no one on this earth that can change that. Amen. Amen. And we can take to heart everything that Lisa's teaching us today. That's a good place to start right there. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Lord, for Michelle and how um, we have seen just your kindnesses throughout her life. Um, I thank you, Lord, for her mom that sits here on the front row and um, I know has been um, just a, a rock in, in her life, and they have brought much joy to each other. I thank you for that. I thank you that you, you bring families together. Even when you think you're running from something, God, you are bringing um, us to something good. And I, I thank you for that. We just ask that you would be um, glorified at the rest of our conference as we worship, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the last session, we looked at our overarching identity as a person who is a Christ follower, blessed, chosen, and adopted for his glory. And thank you, Michelle, for sharing how Christ is glorified in and through you both as he has called you to be your children, but also his child. And so if we have Christ as Savior, we see that we don't have to be wondering what others think of us. We don't have to prop ourselves up with self-image or some sort of, of image maintenance or your Instagram score or your me days. We don't have to define ourselves by the world's labels. Instead, the merciful Father has said that his children are chosen, adopted, and secured with him, blessed in him because of the work of his son. And so Paul continues in Ephesians chapter 1 to expand on who believers are in Christ. And so I want to read, um, I'm actually just going to start right back up at the beginning, just in case we forgot it in the last hour, which is possible, right? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in, in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself 
according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. And in him, we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you also believed, were sealed in him with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the glory, to the praise of his glory. So Paul continues, and he, he continues to expand on who we are, and he continues to tell us what our identity actually is if we are children of God. So first of all, he tells us that the believer is redeemed in, in verses 7 to 10 here. Uh, let me just ask you this question. If you had 15 seconds to tell someone what the gospel is, what would you say? That's typically about the amount of time that you get if you're going to share with someone quickly. 15 seconds. I ride airplanes a lot. Even in the middle of the pandemic, I managed somehow to get status on American Airlines. I don't know how, but you get 15 seconds before someone gets their earplugs in uh, before a flight starts. What would you say if you were talking about the gospel? Well, Paul's given it to us right here in one verse. So look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And then on to verse 8, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. We have redemption. So let's unpack this a little bit. We have redemption. Why do we need to be redeemed? We need to be redeemed because we have trespassed, first of all, against God's law and against his honor. We've crossed the line. We've missed the mark. And there's a presupposition here that we are enslaved to our sin. We're enslaved to our sin. We're fleeing from God. We've turned away from all that is holy. We're slogging out in our own righteousness and getting nowhere. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a really good rule follower. Really good rule follower. But even that isn't going to make me a righteous person because I know that in my heart, can I, can I make a confession here? In my heart, I'm a legalist. I'm a good rule follower. When I walked in here today, I had my mask on. My mask is made out of cheesecloth. <laughs> I'm following the rule on the outside, but in my heart, I am rebelling, right? Trying to keep you safe as well as I can. But the, we've all done that, right? We've all tried to, to do all the good things. And to the very young women who are in here, you 14 and 15-year-olds, wherever you are, right? Doing all of the things that you see people expecting you to do doesn't make you a believer. It just doesn't. And so what does it look like to be redeemed by Christ, recognizing that you're enslaved to your sin without him? This passage tells us that God has poured out his grace on us. He's lavished it. He's, he's given it to us in this overflowing manner. And it's resulted in our redemption through Jesus' blood. When you think of the word lavish or riches, what comes to mind? 
recently I was in Arizona, as I mentioned before, and, and I got together with a childhood friend of mine, somebody I hadn't seen since I think I was 10 years old. And um, I'd reconnected with her family over the years, and her parents had had a lot of influence on my folks and my dad's salvation and early discipleship and my parents' involvement in ministry. And so I just wanted to get together with them and share what the Lord had done through their ministry to my family. So she gives me her address, and I borrowed a car from a friend, and it was a 1989 Honda, and pieces were literally falling off this car. I mean, I sat down, they're, they're standing in the, in the driveway watching me get into their car, and the first thing I do is break the visor, and then I broke the seat. I mean, it was just that kind of car, right? <laughs> so I get in the car, and I'm like, sorry, I'll fix that when I get back. And I drive into the address that I'm given to my friend's house, and I start driving into her community, and I, I mean, the bumper's banging against the wheel in the back, and I'm thinking, start looking at these houses, I'm like, oh my goodness, this place is really swank. <laughs> They're going to call the police on me. <laughs> and then I pulled into their driveway and I parked next to the mint condition 1932 Red Packer. Oh. Right? <laughs> and I think to myself, they're going to tow the car before I can get out of it. <laughs> and then I walk in the front door and there's a to Wooly chandelier with 300 hand-blown bulbs. And I think to myself, this is lavish, over the top. It's a lot. It's rich. And our God's even better than that. Amen. Also because, you know, God's riches can't be removed from us. Your eight-year-old son isn't going to kick a ball and break chihuly bulbs. And so we have to stop and go, what does it mean that God gives to us richly, that he has lavished his grace on us? What does that look like? Well, he tells us that we've been redeemed from the slavery of sin. This is not the redemption that we typically think of where, you know, somebody's given you a, a coupon for free ice cream or you play with your credit card so that you get miles on your favorite airline. This, there's a cost to our redemption. And this picture here comes really from the Old Testament, from, um, from the idea of the Passover lamb. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says that we have been redeemed from our empty way of life that we inherited from our fathers, not with perishable things like silver or, glow, or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. So all those lambs that we think of in the, in the Passover and at the temple, those lambs were brought, we read these, read these stories from the Old Testament. They were sacrificed at the Passover, and they were all pointing toward the one lamb, the one perfect lamb, Jesus, the Son of God, who would sacrifice himself to buy us out of the slave market to sin. In his sacrifice, Christ became, Hebrews tells us, both the sacrifice, the lamb, and the great high priest. We can also think of other examples of redemption from the Old Testament. Uh, we could think of Ruth. Uh, when I spoke here before and we talked about the genealogy from Matthew chapter 1, we, we found that Ruth is in that genealogy, right? Who was Ruth? She was a Gentile woman. She was a pagan prior to coming to know the God of Abraham. So an idolater. She was also a widow. And she was childless. And we know she was a refugee going with her mother-in-law as a poor and hungry person to the land of Israel. And yet Boaz stepped in, provided food for her, a home, honor, a son, and she was redeemed from her previous scenario. She was removed from a situation of poverty 
and desperation and brought to a house where we see plentiful rejoicing. So Ruth the hungry Moabite became the great grandmother to King David and eventually to Jesus the Messiah. But when we look at Christ as our lamb, as, as the one to whom Ruth's redemption points to, as the one whom those sacrifices redemption points to, Jesus isn't just a good example. He was not just a good teacher who came and we can accept a few of the nice things that he said. He didn't come to make our lives easier or just to make you a better person than you are now. He shed his blood in our place so that I would be redeemed from slavery to sin for the praise and glory of God the Father. Redemption is forgiveness of our sins by God. It's a covering and a removal of transgression against God. We begin as debtors, as slaves, and we end with an inheritance. And that debt's not begrudgingly paid by Christ. It's paid for already. It's been lavished on us, lavishly paid, richly poured out. The cost of our redemption is Christ. And the redemption is liberation from the cost of sin, from the penalty of sin and from the bondage to sin. Colossians 1, 13 to 14 tells us, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. But with that comes responsibility. Look back up at verse 5. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us. We have become adopted children of God, and it brings a gain to us and a loss a gain of access to the Father and a loss of our chains to sin for his praise and glory. So not only have we been redeemed, but we've also been informed about God's work and what God intends for our lives as we go forward in this. He's illuminated us. He's made known to us what his plan was. There's a great phrase in here. He has made known to us the mystery of his will. Full stop. Why would the creator of the universe make known anything to us? And yet here he has made known to us the mystery of his will. Now, remember, there's a lot of magic and idolatry going on here in Ephesus. There was a lot of mystery behind the religion of Diana of the Ephesians. And so these people are going, oh, wait, there's mystery with God too? And the Jews who would be reading this would, say, would be saying, well, don't they, these people all have to become Jewish in order to become Christ followers? But God's actually saying, no, right now I'm going to make known to you what my will is. I'm going to give you wisdom and give you understanding. It doesn't matter if you have an advanced degree in theology. You can still see this because God has made it known to you. He has given you his will through his word. If you know Christ today, if you have any understanding of your salvation, it's his gift. He's made known a mystery to you, something that was previously unknown. And he tells us further what that mystery is, that God is taking Jews and those who are not Jews, Gentiles, and he's putting them together into a family, one family of God and he's providing wisdom and understanding for us to understand that we can be chosen by God, even if we're not Jewish, even if we are coming from an idolatrous background. And this should, again, promote our humility. If we have knowledge of salvation, 
We didn't work for it. If we have understanding about the character of God, he's lit a light on it. He's shown his light. He's illuminated us. And he's given it to us in the right time, at the right place in our lives. Jesus came at the right time, and he's made known to us his will and his work at the right time. When you were in third grade, one of the greatest insults anybody could say to you, or at least maybe it was just to me, was, well, you don't know nothing, (laughs) right? And yet what we have here is that I can't figure it out. It's true. I don't know anything about God except what he's revealed to me, what he's made known to me through his word. And so we get to know his plan that he's working out and he's not giving it to us begrudgingly. This passage says it's actually according to his good pleasure to bring things in heaven and things in earth together in Christ so that we would be his children. I don't know if you guys sing this song, but Andrew Peterson has written just the most beautiful song that's taken out of Revelation 5. And he asks the question, do we feel the world is broken? And our answer is, we do, right? We do. And the Apostle John in Romans 5 was shown the great brokenness of the world. And he wept because no one in heaven or on earth was found worthy to fix the mess that he saw. But the lamb, Jesus, was standing there and was able to redeem. And and John wrote that he heard the, the throngs of heaven sing, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood. Here's the mystery of God from every tribe and language and people and nations. And you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Why do we worry? Why do we stress about what people think about us? What could possibly go wrong with a planner like our God? The creator has a plan, and if you are redeemed in him, then you've been chosen to be brought together in that plan for his praise and his glory. So not only have we been blessed and chosen and adopted and redeemed, but we also have a guaranteed inheritance. Now, this passage, uh, starting in verse 11, says, In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. There's a bit of a translation issue here, and some of your versions may say that we are an inheritance. It it could actually read either way. Both are true, right? We are, we have received an inheritance, Christ's inheritance, but we are also Christ's inheritance. We are his inheritance. And so whichever way it gets read, the reality is the church is a gift to Christ for his cross work. And we have an unfading inheritance waiting for us in Christ and because of Christ. We've been predestined according to his purpose. We've inherited because of his predestination, because of his redemption, because of his adoption. This is the outworking of his plan that we have inherited the gifts that God gives to Christ. And the believer's response to God's work is mentioned here because we put our hope in Jesus. That's part of our inheritance gift is hope. That confident expectation of something to come, looking forward to eternity. Again, sometimes we use the word hope like it's um, uh, an Amazon word. Well, I hope someone gives me this for my birthday, right? I I hope that someone buys me that piece of kitchen gadget tree that I can't live without, right? Um, That's not a confident expectation, right? 
but the confident expectation that our God has redeemed us and so there's something better coming is a sure, solid thing. It's in the bank. And that interest is not going to change. The stock market is, crash is not going to make it any different. It's a sure, confident thing. And we can stand here and say, we have inherited Christ's righteousness and the gift of being God's child as a result of that. There is no thwarting God's plan. And again, there's a purpose that's worked out here to bring praise to our God. Is your life, is your salvation, as you're living in that today, is your identity bringing praise to your God? Is your life a signpost that points to him? We have this guaranteed inheritance, and we know that it's guaranteed because it's sealed by the Spirit. The inheritance is guaranteed. It's confirmed. It's clinched. It's settled. We have heard the word of truth, and we believe it. We've been sealed in Jesus with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, there's a, a threefold designation here of who the Spirit is and what he does. The first thing is he's called the Spirit of Promise. Uh, some people think, oh, well, the Holy Spirit just kind of comes at Pentecost in the beginning of Acts when the, when the, church, um, when the church actually uh, is, is coming together right after Christ has gone to heaven. But the reality is all throughout the, whole, the Old Testament, there's reference to God's Spirit. Uh, there's Old Testament festivals and prophets who spoke of the spirit of God. In Joel chapter 2, God promised, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity in the days to come. Men and women, young and old, slave and free, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the prophet Joel. Jesus in John 16 says, I will send the comforter, the counselor, the spirit of truth. The spirit here is promised to those who are calling on the name of the Lord. But the Holy Spirit is also known as the seal of the promise of redemption. He is a mark of ownership. Usually that mark, mark, of, usually that mark of ownership is external. Uh, I lived in Israel for a year when I was in college. And one of the things we do on the weekend is sometimes we, we take a bus down to the coast. I lived up in Jerusalem. We take the bus down to the coast and we kind of dig in, in the hills along by the beach down by Ashkelon. It's where the Philistines used to live. And we would find these jug handles. The jugs would usually be broken, but there'd be a jug handle on it. And there'd be sometimes a little an extra piece of clay on that jug handle. Um, and it would have a name on it or a, an, a set of initials on it that showed the ownership of that jug, to what family that jug would belong. So it's external. It's like a stamp or a brand um, that shows to whom the object or the animal or whatever it is that you're looking at belongs. We, however, are sealed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We know to whom we belong because of that Spirit. During the, the quarantine, when we were all at home at the beginning, like last, last March and April, um, when I was literally beating my head against the wall because I wanted to go out and be with people, <laughs> uh, I, I stumbled on this album that was uh, Romans chapter 8 set to music, verse by verse. And it was so beautiful to actually stop and go, even though I am not with my people, I am still sealed by the Holy Spirit. And Romans 8.15 tells us that we know to whom we belong. You have received the spirit of adoption, it says, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, showing us that we are God's children and his heirs. So we are sealed 
We, we know to whom we belong. The Holy Spirit is also a guarantee of the final inheritance that is to come. Uh, the Greek word that's used here in, in modern Greek is actually the same word for guarantee that's used for engagement ring. Uh, so there's, there's this down payment of what is to come. So the Spirit is the beginning of our inheritance that is sure and steadfast and sealed to come in the future. John 14, 18 says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Then I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. If the Spirit of God is in you, you have a guaranteed inheritance. And it's not just a matter of something that will come later. He is with us now helping us to walk day by day in the inheritance that is both now and yet to come. We are trust fund kids. I just love that phrase. We're trust fund kids. It's a sure thing. The market change is not going to change that God has sealed us and given us an inheritance that is Jesus Christ. The Spirit is the proof of the already and the not yet, the redemption now and the complete restoration of our inheritance and relationship with God to come. So what are the implications for us? What does it matter that we are blessed in Christ? It matters that we know who we are. We live in a world that has no concept of what the truth of identity actually is. Carl Truman is a church historian and philosopher, and he recently wrote that 30 years ago, if you went to the doctor and said, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, the doctor would have said that something is wrong with your mind. Today, if you say that, the doctor will say there's something wrong with your body. This is an example of the disordered identity that our world is fooling itself with. The world's identity what asks what feels like it's true. We at times become subject to the whims of our emotion and the impact of that culture that we live in. But biblical worldview asks the question, what is really real? What is truly true? You see how they're in conflict with each other, the world and the scriptures? We have an unchangeable reality, an unchangeable identity if we know Christ as Savior. We get to live differently. If we say we love God, we're going to love other people too. If we say we've been reconciled with God, that means we can be reconciled and live with one another in peace that he gives to us. Who are we? What's our identity? How do we live? We are blessed, not doomed. We're chosen, not rejected. We're adopted, not abandoned. We're redeemed, not enslaved. We're sealed not floundering. We are his workmanship. Look back at those verbs in your notes. We're blessed, chosen, adopted, redeemed, sealed. And it's all his work. So it can be trusted. We can rest on that. Because of who we are in him, we have been, rece we have been redeemed and we've received an inheritance and put our hope in Christ. This changes how we get up in the morning. This changes how we care for our children. This changes why I go to work and how I do my work. It changes how I look at myself in the mirror. It impacts the words that should boil up in our hearts. This truth should shape and shift our understanding of what is important. Recognizing our true identity, blessed in Christ, changes 
everything. Because of Jesus, we've been called to believe in him and to live for him so that others would see us and praise him. Father, thank you for calling us. Thank you for adopting us. Thank you for calling us to be your children. May all we do and say and speak be for your glory, O Lord. May the world see us and recognize Jesus. May he be beautiful because of how we live our lives. Lord, we know that you haven't chosen us just for our own sake. You chose us because you loved us and because you loved your son, but also so that we would point to him and to you. And so, Lord, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.